As the calendar flipped from the 17th to the 18th century, the Enlightenment was really firing on all cylinders. And if there was one key uh, mode of the Enlightenment, of course, it is critique. Looking around at the social world that uh, had been constructed by them, a very sophisticated world as far as they were concerned, and seeing, well, what uh, what works? Why do we do things this way? What's, uh, what's that about? And uh, no institution, no tradition, no cultural edifice was immune from this, including some of the, the most fundamental. The British writer Mary Astell publishes on, in the year 1700 a, uh, <clears throat> a bit of an attack on the institution of marriage. Uh, she is a, uh, a, a noted uh, early feminist. She is a uh, prolific uh, writer in her own right. Almost entirely self-educated, a, uh, a bit of a publishing force who got on the, uh, the, the London scene and attracted some considerable notice by the likes of Jonathan Swift and Daniel Defoe. Uh, she was uh, a force to be reckoned with in those circles. And in 1700, she publishes some reflections upon marriage, uh, where she really begins to question, well, you know, what's this about? What's what's in it for both parties? Not just the, uh, not just, uh, you know, oh, you know, women have it bad, but also, you know, what do men really get out of it? What's, uh, what's the value of it? Significantly, biographically, uh, she was single her entire life. She refused to marry. There's some, we don't know a lot about her life, but, uh, and there's some speculation that she might have had a, uh, a, a, she might have gone a little far down the line with someone in terms of almost becoming engaged, but then that didn't work out. Whatever. She, uh, she stayed single her entire life. Um, and, and that kept her free to write and to engage and to not have to worry about being someone's, uh, little missus at home. She, uh, she refused to sacrifice that identity that she had fought so hard to build for herself. Um, and some reflections upon marriage, one of the two primary works that we have from her is a, uh, an interesting example of this because I uh, just the clear curiosity of what we get out of something uh, so socially interwoven um, as the institution of marriage. Uh, it, it, she, she writes, if marriage be such a blessed state, how come, how comes it, may you say, that there are so few happy marriages? Now answer to this, it is not to be wondered that so few succeed. We should rather be surprised to find so many do, considering how imprudently men engage, the motives they act by, and the very strange conduct they observe throughout. <laughs> Where you see this character of this very frank assessment, well, okay, let's just take an objective look at this, uh, which is the Enlightenment all over. And she is just... Pastel is just giving a, uh, a, uh, an empirical probe of what is the, uh, what is the result. We, we're going to test all the, uh, uh, we're going to test all the factors here and see, well, what comes out at the other end? Is it really ultimately worthwhile? What is the cost benefit ratio here? Um, <clears throat> And, and she questions the uh, the financial arrangements of marriage and how uh, and well it was largely among the upper classes at least um, and also honestly throughout uh, marriage was a broadly economic arrangement where families would arrange that okay you you have a son and I have a daughter and what can we work out between us? And there were dowries exchanged and there were, you know, contracts uh, signed. And this was a very uh, baldly financial, you know, contract. Um, the, uh, the, the happy couple may not even know one another on the day of their marriage. It was just you know, kind of the idea of individual affection between them is really sort of quaint. But she looks at that 
for prey? What do men propose to themselves in marriage? What qualifications do they look after in a spouse? What will she bring? is the first inquiry. How many acres? How or how much ready coin? Not that this is altogether an unnecessary question, for marriage without a, comp without a competency, that is, is only a bare subsistence, and even a handsome and plentiful provision according to the quality and circumstances of the parties is no very comfortable condition. It's a little arch there, no very comfortable condition. Uh, she's being a little uh, sharp as the uh, as the arrow would have it but um uh taking it head on on that economic scale uh those who marry for love as they call it find time enough to repent their rash folly and are not long in being convinced that whatever fine speeches might be made in the heat of passion there can be no real kindness between those who can agree to make each other miserable um looking down the line uh, you can see there that, okay, she, she's observing that these two people uh, um, may or may not be compatible at this point, but having studied other examples of couples, we can project, based on the knowledge that we have, the inputs that we have, we can project that, okay, the odds are that the relationship is going to end up in that place as opposed to this. So she's not just saying, okay, happily ever after, bam, there you go. She is applying the reason, the mental faculties to forecast where that relationship is going to go. Um, and she is saying, you know, why are we still doing this? What, uh, what is the purpose? But suppose a man does not marry for money, though for one that does not, perhaps there are thousands that do. Suppose he marries for love, an heroic action, which makes a mighty noise in the world, partly because of its rarity and partly in regards of its extravagancy. What does his marrying for love amount to? There are there's no great odds between his marrying for the love of money or for the love of beauty. The man does not act according to reason in either case, but is governed by irregular appetites. And there you can see again the prioritization of reason. Uh, the the irregular appetites is the the, the frustration with emotion and you know perhaps uh, lust or greed or these other more primal things that reason is supposed to smooth away. But he loves her wit, perhaps, and this you'll say is more spiritual, more refined. Not at all, if you examine it to the bottom examine it to the bottom. If you examine it to the bottom, if you just apply reason and you look at it and you focus, we can realize that this is something much more uh, complicated than perhaps just on the surface. That's the enlightenment right there. For what is, for what is that which nowadays passes under the name of wit, a better and ill-natured rarity, a pert repartee, or a confident talking at all? And in such a multitude of words, it's odds if if something or other does not pass that is surprising, though everything that does surprise does not please, some things being wondered at for their ugliness, as well as others for their beauty. And here you can see like uh, her, her rejection of, uh, ver well, her rejection of verbal repartee, uh, flirting essentially, uh, which is a, uh, a, 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 it is verbal and it is, uh, and it is a kind of wit, but it is generally driven by, uh, you know, less than reason. Reasonable people don't necessarily flirt very much or at least very well. But here is a, uh, a, a, you know, like, oh, I don't have time for that. That's just silliness. Uh, that is reason at work, rejecting the playfulness, the silliness of, uh, of uh, the speech between lovers, which is, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a fair shot. Uh, but do women never choose a miss? And are men only at fault? Again, this is not a polemic. This is, well, it's kind of a polemic. But uh, she's willing to cast the light on both sides of this equation. That is not pretended, for, she, for he who will be just must be forced to acknowledge that neither sex are always in the right. 
A woman, indeed, can't properly be said to choose. All that is allowed her is to, is to refuse or accept what is offered. And when we have made such reasonable allowances as are due to the sex, perhaps they may not appear so much in fault as one would first imagine, and a generous spirit will find more occasion to pity than reprove. Leading with a little humanity there, leading with a little objectivity, um, suggesting that, okay, you know, you don't get swept up in the condemnation of women who uh, perhaps uh, make a bad choice or men who make a bad choice. Don't uh, get swept up in that uh, renouncing mode, but just, okay, let's think about this. Let's be calm but also sinking in uh, a little bit of uh, emotion there, a little bit of pity, a little bit of uh, empathy. Not always the biggest quality celebrated by the Enlightenment, but here significantly in a woman's voice, a call that, okay, you know, reason doesn't have to be cold. Reason doesn't have to be uh, cruel. But alas, what poor woman is ever taught that she should have a higher design than to get a husband? Heaven will fall in, of course, and if she makes but an obedient and dutiful right wife, she cannot miss of it. A husband, indeed, is thought by both sexes so very valuable that scarce a man who can keep himself clean and make a bow, but thinks he is good enough to pretend to any woman, no matter for the difference of birth or fortune, a husband is such a wonder-working name as to make an equality or something more, whatever it is obtained. Yeah, uh, men are often uh, sought after, a good uh, catch, if you will. Um, and the, uh, she is saying, well, no, let's, uh, let's not get caught up in the PR. I mean, what, what are we really buying there? Uh, okay. You know, maybe he has a nice living. Uh, maybe he's got a nice big house in the country, but, um, is he really someone you want to spend any time with at all? But some sage persons may perhaps object that were that were women allowed to improve themselves and not amongst other discouragements driven back by the wise jests and scoffs that are put upon a woman of sense or learning a philosophical lady as she is called by way of ridicule they would be too wise and too good for the men and here she's launching into uh one of the great issues that uh, that she deals with deals with primarily in her other big work is uh, as an advocate for the education of women. She is calling for or questioning the value of, let's say, uh, in this, uh, women would be or questioning the value of not educating women if they are to be uh, partners in a household or at least even just junior partners. Uh, she is questioning the idea that, well, you know, if, if women don't know anything but how to, uh, how to apply some rouge, uh, what can we expect of them? Uh, and the men will be. Oh, an educated man coming home at the end of the day, you know, is just going to be sitting there talking to somebody who doesn't know anything, uh, cannot run a household. Uh, doesn't have the intellectual capacity to manage books or do anything that a housewife traditionally would be responsible for. And so she is, uh, she is just an impediment to happiness and the efficient running of a household in that, uh, in that uh, scenario. So why subject women to that? Why make them go through life uh, completely ignorant? Remember, uh, Mary Astell did not really did not receive a formal education. Her brothers did. Uh, she came from a uh, not wealthy, but a you know a, a not uncomfortable family. Uh, she had an uncle who uh, was a I believe an Anglican uh, Anglican higher up, perhaps a priest or something, and uh, and would loan her books and was responsible for the little uh for the little education she got really uh that wasn't just purely self-driven and uh she had to 
deal with these uh, these setbacks throughout her life. He has to deal with being always at a uh, at a, at a disadvantage in any in any environment. To wind up this matter, if a woman were true, were duly principled and taught to know the world, especially the true sentiments that men have of her, and the traps they lay for her under so many gilded compliments and such a and such a seemingly great respect that disgrace would be prevented, which is brought upon too many families, women would marry more discreetly and demean themselves better in a married state than some people say they do. And there you see the core of the Enlightenment, where she is laying out the, uh, the hope of improvement, of making society better. Not just, not just women, not just herself, but making society better. She is looking at the institution of marriage and saying, what can we do to make it better? Make it just a little bit more efficient, just a little bit more productive. How can we make it better? Now, she does this, of course, by applying her reason and concluding that what is, uh, what is lacking is a lack of reason and that we need to focus more on a, uh, an intellectual capacity for women to bolster their reasonable capacities so that they can then make the institution itself more reasonable and ultimately society more productive. It is a calculation in her head. And uh, it's uh, arguably a little con confrontational, arguably a little controversial. Uh, people can be very uh, upset if uh, our core social, uh, our core social institutions are questioned. Uh, generally, conservative forces push back against that kind of stuff, uh, and she took an awful lot of heat. But the instinct at play is a, I think, arguably uh, uh, unobjectionable, and b it is a perfect. Uh, demonstration of Enlightenment philosophy, the focus on how do we use our reason to make life better. And she's funny along the way, not in a, uh, not in, she's not cracking jokes, she's not Jonathan Swift. Uh, Jonathan Swift kind of smacked her down for some of her ideas about marriage. But she has the classic barbs and edge and smiling while she twists the knife attitude that you can see in the very best writers of that era.